Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the NEON Museum, we would like to welcome you all to this year's Scholar in Residence featuring the acclaimed Dr. Su Fan Chung. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Randy Chung, Director of Education and Outreach at the NEON Museum. Before I make the formal introductions, couple of housekeeping items. Again, welcome everyone, especially all of our members, all of our trustees, and all of you enthusiasts, you are in for a treat. As the presentation begins, if you have any questions, please type those into the chat. There will be plenty of time at the end for Dr. Chung to give you all that knowledge and answer all of your questions. On behalf of the NEON Museum, we'd also like to thank our sponsor, the NEON, the Nevada Arts Council, and of course, our supportive board. Um, the Nevada Arts Council receives support from the National Endowment of the Arts. Here we go. The acclaimed Dr. Chung is highly accomplished writer, historian, and re retired professor from UNLV. She started teaching history at UNLV in 1976 and then retired in 2015 as P Professor Emerita. Some of her accomplishments include chairperson of the UNLV History Department, Clark County Asian Commissioner, executive producer of the Vegas PDF, PBS um, documentary, Island Mountain Days. She has won numerous awards for her books and some of the most famous titles include Miners and Merchants in the American West, in Pursuit of Gold and Chinese in the Woods. She has received awards such as Lions Club Outstanding Educa Educator Award and Nevada Humanities Outstanding Nevadan Award. With all that being said, again, you folks are in for a treat. I will welcome on behalf of the Neon Museum, Dr. Su Fan Chung. Thank you, Randy. What a nice introduction. Uh, shall we begin the talk? Steve? Steve is showing the slides. Okay. Originally, it was entitled Synology and Sin City, but we decided to make it more academic, and so it, it, it's now titled The Chinese of Las Vegas, A Brief History with a Few of the, Their Contributions. Next. One of the things we have to remember is where these Chinese came from. And they emigrated primarily from the province of Guangdong. About two or 5% came from Fujian province, which is right next door. These are two of China's 18 provinces in southeastern China. And at that time, China was larger than the United States. So each province, as you can tell, uh, is larger and, and therefore covers more territory. They traveled from the southeastern part of China, past Japan, into San Francisco, and eventually uh, other ports will open up in Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Next. They came, the original group or came originally from a small area in Guangdong province. Uh, most of the Chinese immigrants came from the four districts. Here you see it in green. Today they added another one, so it's five districts today. Uh, then they came from the three districts, and that is in purple. Uh, the, the third group came from Zhongshan, mostly urbanites and merchants. And in fact, the first merchant in San Francisco was a man from Zhongshan who spoke English very well, Norman Ah Singh, opened a, a restaurant and a, and a store, and that actually became a naturalized citizen, which will be prohibited later. They emigrated out of Guangzhou, what we know as Canton, or Hong Kong, the two red areas, and eventually the other brown uh, areas, districts will also send immigrants next. They traveled by junk, uh, taking months uh, to make the crossing, uh, traveling often with friends and relatives. This was the least expensive way to get to the United States, uh, but it was also one of the most dangerous. Uh, 
It was safer to travel by steamship, such as the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, but it was more expensive. Next. When they traveled, they traveled on steerage class, which meant that they could only go topside once a day and they had to bring their own food. And so sometimes, you know, bringing your own food for three months is really difficult. They paid $50 in gold coin to travel to the United States and then $30 to travel back. Usually, uh, you know, it was a rough crossing next. But eventually the Chinese could travel on first class if they had enough money. And here we see Zhou Sheng, who has connections to Las Vegas, traveling on first class on the dollar line, which superseded the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, and his friends traveling from China back to California. Next. The Chinese were attracted to coming to the United States because they heard that the streets were paved with gold and they wanted to get involved in mining, which you could become rich overnight. It was a dream of theirs. And here you see in the 1860s, a Chinese miner in Nevada carrying a long time, a long time split in half carried on a shoulder pole because often miners had to move from one place to another. Next. At first, they mined with other ethnic groups, but eventually they found it was safer to mine in groups of 20 to 25 and organizing themselves in that way so that they could also be protected from anyone from the outside who wanted to uh, steal from them or kill them or beat them up or anything like that. Next. The other thing that they did in connection with all of this, which is less well known, is to make charcoal wood um, or wood into charcoal to be used for fueling trains, processing ores, providing heat to the communities, and all kinds of things like that. And we know that the Chinese were expert at this because they had made Chinese ink as early as 206 BC from the soot of the charcoal wood kiln. And these kilns could be found throughout the United States. And it's interesting that the kilns that are most likely found still in extent um, are beehive kilns that are, are of Italian origin. Next. Well, we still even have Chinese miners in the area in the mid 20th century. Sam Yet began mining in Searchlight in 1905 and was a popular figure both in Los Angeles and Las Vegas where he uh, had his recreation. While Chinese were making $1 per day, Sam Yet struck it rich and owned a lot of property and rich mines. For example, in, 19, in, the, in 1954, he sold part of his mining property to a Long Beach syndicate for $45,000, adding to his wealth. Unfortunately, his wife had died and he had no heirs. And so he left his immense fortune to his good friend, the local sheriff, Searchlight. Next. The other thing that drew Chinese to the United States was the building of railroads. The transcontinental railroad, interstate railroads, intrastate railroads. And this, of course, provided much of the development of the American West and could not have been done as rapidly if they had not used Chinese labor that was steady, loyal, and worked very hard. The Central Pacific had 80 to 90% of its workforce as Chinese with Euro-American supervisors. They came primarily from overseas, but the original group was hired domestically from mining communities. And what we see is that two companies were big into recruiting Chinese laborers, not only for the trains, but also for other activities like, such as agriculture. And this was Sisson and Wallace connected to uh, Charles Crocker, one of the big four, and a Dutchman named Cornelius Kupsman Shop and Company. Next. After the Chinese worked on the Central Pacific, creating the first transcontinental 
the railroad uh, connecting the East Coast with the West Coast so that trade with China could be much easier. They've worked on numerous other lines, including the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, the Carson and Colorado, the, Benton, the Bodie and Benton Railroad, and little interstate railroads like interstate railroads like the, uh, the Palisades and Eureka Railroad. But in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act which prohibited Chinese laborers from entering the United States, uh, saw a decrease in Chinese population. And so they did not work on the railroad line that came into Las Vegas in 1905, next. But they did build roads. And here you see a group of Chinese working on road building. Now, this is an interesting story because most of the states had laws prohibiting Chinese from working on public works, such as building roads. But what people could do to circumvent this was hire a contractor who would then subcontract Chinese workers to build a lot of these public roads. Next. The anti-Chinese movement, which really began to heat up in the 1870s, was very full of violence. Um, the Chinese were hung, lynched in 1871 in Los Angeles, uh, in Truckee. Uh, the anti-Chinese agitators liked to burn the houses of the Chinese and shoot them as they tried to escape from the burning house. Uh, there were hundreds of stories and hundreds of incidents of violence and discrimination against the Chinese. They were not allowed to have equal rights at, to, as Americans. They could not be naturalized, uh, and they did not fulfill the terms of the Burlingame Treaty, which supposedly gave them equal status to Americans. Next. One of the things that happened to them was the passage of the 1892 Gary Act, uh, and it required that the Chinese carry identification papers. And this, of course, was tried more recently as we tried to get Muslims to carry identification papers. And so you had to have a certificate of residence or a certificate of identity. If you were caught without that, you could be arrested by the sheriff and immediately deported back to China. Next. Next. And even if you were born in the United States and was a citizen, you still had to have one of these documents. Um, and what we see is it wasn't cheap. The photograph had to be three copies of the identical photograph. It cost 75 cents for the three copies. If you only made a dollar a day, you could see that this was a burden on your income. Plus you had to pay the lawyer who helped you fill out all the forms and, and make it legal next. Well, in 1905, the train finally arrived in Las Vegas, next. And in these kinds of frontier towns, one of the first groups that come in are the Chinese laundrymen. And we know that in 1905, Ying Li opened his shop uh, in Las Vegas, next. And one of the reasons for going into the laundry work was that village cloth makers in southeastern China lost their jobs when China lost the opium war to the British in the 1840s. And the British then imported their industrial made cloth into China. And it became cheaper to buy British cloth than to buy the village made cloth. And so when the Chinese emigrated and entered the United States, they, they found that laundry and working with cloth was something they had done for years. And they devised different methods, such as heating the iron around the stove so that they always had a hot iron to uh, iron the clothes quickly. And they also used traditional methods, uh, such as this ninth century painting of ladies in the court ironing silk, using coal as the basis of keeping the iron hot. Next. And so what we see happening is that Chinese laundries thrived until the advent of the home washing machine in the 1950s. Next. One of the interesting aspects of taking your clothes to the Chinese laundry 
beginning in the 1870s and later, was you could play this Chinese game. Now, you might not have understood it. It was 80 characters, a Chinese poem, on a piece of paper, and you marked a certain number of the characters, and you might have won, uh, as one woman did. She bet 25 cents and won $50, and that drew a lot of others to the laundry. And eventually, the game became so popular that Americans wanted to translate it into a game called Kino, in which the 80 characters became 80 numbers next. When we see Las Vegas developing, and North First Street was one of the early places uh, that they opened up, and we see the Chinese cooks often were hired to work in the hotels and clubs on North First Street. Why hire them as cooks? because in China, Cantonese cooks were renowned for their delicious cuisine. Next. Some of the restaurants or places to eat were very simple, wooden tables, wooden chairs, but eventually some of the interiors of the restaurants had a very Asian and elaborate look. Next. They served inexpensive meals, such as chow mein, chop suey, uh, soup noodles. Next. And they learned, they realized that they had to learn to cook American food. And so eventually a cookbook appeared, which had Chinese and English so that they could practice their English as well. Now you might say, well, these Chinese were supposed to be illiterate. How could they read a cookbook like that? In China at this time, in order to be considered literate, you had to know the 13 Confucian classics by heart and be able to reproduce any part of it by heart. Simply reading the newspaper or reading a simple book or going to the market and seeing what was there uh, was not being literate or considered literate. So reading a cookbook was not that much of a challenge for these early Chinese. Next. Well, by 1928, neon signs appeared in Las Vegas to attract people to come to tour Las Vegas. Next. And many of the signs were neon signs. Now we don't have any extant Las Vegas Chinese neon signs, but you can see how clever some of them were. Here is China Garden Cafe in, youth, in Utah with this absolutely adorable Chinese lady attracting you in, to eat there. Next. Las Vegas at night lit up was terrific uh, and drew many people there. Next. The Fong brothers opened their Rainbow Cafe in Las Vegas from 1922 to 1933. And people said you never went away hungry from Rainbow Cafe. And they were able to do this because their father had been a cook for General Pershing during the Pancho Villa uh, escapade, you might say. And General Pershing got an exemption for the Fong clan to come and settle in the United States and they chose Las Vegas. They moved on to open the Silver Cafe on First Street from 1933 to 1947. And in 1933, it was one of only four restaurants that you could eat at in Las Vegas, next. But eventually the Chinese felt that they should have a more Chinese flavor or architectural structure to their restaurants. And so you see the Chinese garden restaurant that originally was on West Sahara Avenue. Next. Famous cooks were attracted to Las Vegas. Even today, we have some famous, <clears throat> famous Cantonese cooks. But one of my favorite cooks was Gu Gim Hua, who had arrived uh, at the age of 12 in San Francisco and passed away in 1980. She cooked in Pioche, Nevada for President Herbert Hoover, who was a stockholder in the Prince Mine. He loved her steak and apple pie cooked in a wooden stove. And many Las Vegans traveled to her restaurants until she passed away, eating her delicious Chinese or American food. Next. Now, we think about some other contributions of the Chinese. And one of them, of course, is opium smoking. The first anti-opium law was passed in 1875 because 
it turned out that opium smoking attracted not only the Chinese, but the Euro-Americans and other groups. And, and it took until 1914 with the Harrison Act to stop the importation and distribution of opium. But opium was still used in American medication as a painkiller. And if you smoked only 25 cents worth of opium, why that was at more, more like taking aspirin than it was to become an addict. You had to do much more to become an addict. Another aspect was playing mahjong. And in the 1920s, mahjong became popularized in many places in the United States. And this is a traditional mahjong set mix. Well, Chinese merchants also began to open stores selling goods to Chinese Americans and to the general public. And on your left is a rural Chinese merchant store. And on your right is a more urban Chinese merchant store. Next. But the biggest merchant of the early 20th century was Zhou Sheng. He had a 54 store chain called the National Dollar Store and opened the, his National Dollar Store in Las Vegas on Fremont Street from 1952 until the late 1970s. And here you can see the National Dollar Store and the family. The oldest girl here is Beth Milton. And this is Doris who will play a major role in the cultural activities of Las Vegas. Next. The Chinese also served in the military and that's often forgotten. From, World War, from the Civil War until World War I, into World War II, into the Korean War and so forth, we see that the Chinese uh, served in the military. This is Charles Key and we'll take a look at his brothers, William and Frank a little later. Next. Chinese fought in the Korean War and we see that Dr. Su Kim Chang of UNLV Special Collections uh, has a picture of her father uh, in the Korean War. And one of my students who is Eurasian, uh, Rosette Wirtz, was in UNLV ROTC, later served in Desert Storm and earned the status of being a captain, Mix. With China as an ally in World War II, the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed with a lot of effort. And the War Bride Act and other immigration laws, especially the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, opened the door for increased Chinese immigration from all over China. The reunification of families such as the Fong clan were able to bring over their mother, as well as the growth of Chinese families and communities throughout Nevada and throughout the United States. Next. Boulder City, the Boulder Dam and Nellis Air Force Base helped Nevada grow even larger. And it became the tourist center and entertainment capital or Sin City uh, for many Americans. Next. The Chinese also participated in this. They opened casinos in Northern Nevada having had casinos very early in the uh, late 19th century, but next, but next, but also opened them, tried to open them in Southern Nevada. And in 1931, when gaming became legalized, Wu Sing unsuccessfully applied for a gaming license in Clark County. It was turned down because he was Chinese. So he decided to open the famous Chinatown nightclub which featured people like Bo Ling and Bo Ching, a, a sister act who went on to Hollywood to become very famous. And then the Chinese realized that there was an area in which they could specialize. Uh, and that was the African-American population and the work class that did not feel comfortable in the major casinos next. And so what we see happening is places like the West Las Vegas El Cid Club, later renamed the El Real Club, opened from 1950 to 1957 for primarily African-American customers. William and Frank Key um, were born in Hawthorne and raised in Tonopah, continued the tradition of opening casinos 
uh, in the west side of Las Vegas, but a fire that at the end of 1956 uh, caused Willie to have a heart attack. And eventually his brother, Frank, who's on your right-hand side, decided that he wanted to sell out. So he sold it out to another group of Chinese who closed the casino much later. Next. The El Rio was located on North 8th Street, was noted for its good food. Next. And we see that others also joined into this, especially the Fong brothers, who opened the Town Tavern on Jackson from 1957, 1959 to 1970. And eventually other owners reopened it from 1981 uh, until the late 1990s. And it was also well known for its jazz performances, lounge shows, and good food, but not surprising since they had owned a restaurant earlier. Next. But the color line was broken in 1958 when Mon Moon Ong became the first Chinese American dealer at the Fremont Hotel and Casino in downtown Las Vegas. His wife became the first Chinese American. Clark County employee, and his sons, the first Las Vegas firemen who were Chinese American. Finally, his daughter, Kathleen, became the first lady of Nevada as Mrs. Steve Sisolak in 2019. Next. The Chinese also invested in other casinos. Um, they, they invested in the one of the shortest lived casinos called the Lucky Dragon Hotel and Casino that existed from 2016 to 2018. And they, they also invested in the Red Dragon and Rush Hour to small casinos. They're located on Spring Mount, for example, all having an Asian theme catering to Asian gamblers and investors. Next. Well, the Chinese also participate in entertainment world. Uh, in Las Vegas from the 1930s to the 1940s, and especially in the post-World War II era. Scantily dressed ladies were often featured, perhaps inspired by Winnemucca-born Charlie Lowe, who opened the popular Forbidden City in San Francisco, in which uh, many former soldiers uh, visited, and they had strip tees, and they had Flamenco dancers, but all Chinese performers. Next. And so it was unusual that in 1955, the Dunes Hotel featured GMO, a stripper who was born in Sichuan, China, to a Chinese minister. She was a college graduate in the United States and married a Euro American and still was willing to perform in this scandalous activity. Next. Well, this led to young girls dreaming about being showgirls in Las Vegas. And here is um, Hazel Huey Lee, who was born in Carson City and by the 1950s became a showgirl in Las Vegas. And you, you can see from this picture of her uh, in high school, um, she has nice long legs and that's part of the feature of her performances next. Well, the hotels, uh, opened with a variety of different Asian American performers like the Tong Brothers at the Sahara, entertainers at Flamingo. And by the 1970s, Chinese entertainers were headliners at the major casino, especially during Chinese New Year, which occurs in mid January to early February, according to the lunar calendar. Next. And one of my favorites on a long time review was the China Dow Review at the Flamingo and featuring people like Frances Fong, who then moved on to Hollywood to be a Screen Actors Guild member and very active in movies. Next. And casinos also put on Broadway shows with Chinese themes such as Flower Drunk Song and The World of Susie Wong. Next. Now to different individuals who would make contributions. One of our first uh, is Richard Tam, who died in 1999. He was a real estate developer on Sahara, 
especially around the original station casino on Sahara and also the area around it, as well as other parts of Las Vegas. He is known for raising the funds for the UNLV's TAM Alumni Center and other projects. And a park is named in his honor. Next. Yi Kung Lok brought the legalization of acupuncture to Nevada, the first state on the mainland, Hawaii was first, first state on the mainland to legalize acupuncture and give it a head start to its popularity beginning in the 1970s. Although Chinese medicine had a long history in the United States, we see a growing number of people turning to Chinese medicine to solve some of their medical problems. Next. One of the other areas was miscegenation. Um, in 1861, Nevada was the second state to pass an anti-miscegenation law, but allowed Chinese to marry Native Americans, Mexicans, Spanish, African Americans, Portuguese, and so forth. Don't ask me how these got that way. But the law was repealed in 1959, and today Las Vegas has large multi-ethnic Asian American population. So on your right hand side, you see Bertha Coffey Chang, age 16 in 1910, who had a Shoshone mother. And on your left, you see two young men who have a, 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 a Euro-American father and a Chinese mother, next. Las Vegas also had Chinese newspapers and, and they not only carried news about China and Chinese Americans in the United States, but also carried stories about problems related to the, the community. And so here is a story on Sloan Canyon, an endangered Native American site that the newspaper wanted its readers to know about. Next. The Chinese also shared their traditional culture, such as New Year's festivities with the larger population. Next. Lunar New Year's was a big casino celebration, still is, uh, as well as other venues in Las Vegas. So in the center, we see the Meadows School in their annual uh, Chinese New Year's parade at, at Caesar's Palace. And to your right at the bottom, um, the uh, Chinatown Mall, Chinese New Year's celebration. Next. In 1995, Taiwan developer James Chen opened the Chinatown Plaza Mall with numerous Asian restaurants and shops near the site, what near the former site of Doc and Eddie's, which you can see at the Neon Museum. Next. Religion also was brought over to the United States. On the left, you see a traditional uh, restaurant altar. And on the right, you see an altar from the Tuscarora George Joss House that was featured in the 1950s Las Vegas Village. And today we see some Buddhist temples being established in and around Las Vegas. Next. Chinese American students were always active in their high schools and we see uh, and high academic achievers. And so in 1964, you see Kathy in the Rivenettes, uh, second, uh, second row on your left-hand side. And you see Alex on your right-hand side at the top uh, being named presidential scholar with President Bush in the foreground. Next. Banking was important in Las Vegas and in 1959, Wing Fong, a well-known businessman and philanthropist and a very nice person, was director of the Nevada State Bank and later a major stockholder in Frontier Saving and Loan. He was a real estate developer, a landowner, and a fundraiser for UNLV. Next. His wife was the first Chinese American public school teacher in Las Vegas in 1950. And in 1955, the Fong clan opened Fong's Garden on East Fremont and Charleston. Next. For all of their activities, we see that Lily was the Nevada president of the Association for American University of Women, served on the Board of Regents for 10 years, uh, served on many boards and commissions throughout Las Vegas and Nevada. And her favorite saying was, 
education is the equalizer of, man, of mankind. So here on the left, on the right, you see the Fong family. On the left, you see Mr. and Mrs. Fong with Cheryl Lau and Senator Richard Bryan. Next. And so in 1992, the Wing and Lily Fong Elementary School was dedicated and Lily Fong Geoscience Building at UNLV also carries her name. Next. Another family that plays a big role in Las Vegas were the Ted and Dora Sho Lee family. You can see their two sons, Greg on your right and Ernest on your left. And they have been very active in cultural activities, supporting the symphony and others. Next. In addition to land development, uh, the Sun Lee clan operated two casinos called Eureka, one in Las Vegas and the other in Mesquite. Um, they were famous for their, their Fat Choy restaurant and um, Greg turned over the Sahara Eureka Casino, a smaller casino, to its employees in 2015, making it the first all employee owned casino in Las Vegas. Next. Another group, uh, another family were the Wongs, Buck and Aurora Wong and their children, Tim and Nancy, who own Arcata Associates. Next. When it got started in North Las Vegas, it hired 3,000 people, and then it grew so large that it had to move to Fire Mesa Street in Las Vegas. It is an engineering consulting firm for the aerospace industry and has won both national and international awards. Next. Farrell Lau was Nevada Secretary of State from 1991 to 1994, the first Asian American to be elected to a major state office in Nevada. After that term, she served as the Republican House Representative um, for Congress and currently serves in a number of Nevada boards. Next. Well, realizing that the um, Chinese American population was growing and becoming politically active, Harry Reid decided he needed a staffer who was Chinese American and hired Beth Ao and then later other Chinese Americans uh, to be on his staff. And we see that the Asian American population in Nevada is one of the fastest growing ethnic minorities in Nevada. Next. Numerous others have made contributions to Las Vegas. Vida Lynn Chan in business, heading the uh, Clark County Asian American Commission. The late Dr. Clifford Lee was an early Chinese American physician in Las Vegas. And we have Judge Jerry Tao, who is on the Ellett's Court next. And many American Chinese American notables include Michael Chang, who won his international titles while being a resident in Henderson. And Tony Shaft recently passed away as an internet entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and developer of Las Vegas's Chinatown, uh, downtown, next. And we have cultural activities with poet Stephen Liu and Bill Leaf as an artist, next. And Chinese Americans serving in various committees and raising funds for causes such as Dan and Esther Louie, who were part of Las Vegas's Lions Club and raised a su substantial amount of money for the Brain Center, and Si Ching, who worked on the Rural Development Commission. Next. And then, of course, we have Governor Stephen Sisolak and his second wife, Kathleen Ann Sisolak, who were married in 20. 18, next. And we see this population, which was very slow to start growing larger and larger with each passing year, next. And so we turn to one of the aspects of Chinese culture that got national attention, and that is in No Passport Required with Chef Marcus Samuelson, he featured Chinese American restaurants in Las Vegas, next. 
And so we see with the new immigration laws and more Chinese from all over China and Taiwan, a greater variety of Chinese food being offered from Western China, hot and spicy dishes and a handful of noodles, next. Dim sum, not only from South China, but also from North China, which has a more vinegary taste. South China has a sweet, sour taste. Next. And a variety of dishes from Hainan Island to chicken lettuce cups to seafood galore. Next. And all kinds of duck and lobster. And here you see the peapod duck and a peapod Chinese instrument. Next. And we won the first Chinese restaurant, North American Michelin Award, the Wei Lai, Wing Lai Restaurant at the Wynn next. And so we end the meal and end the talk with fortune cookies, which are not of Chinese origin, but popularized in Chinese restaurants in the early 20th century. And they all contain a fortune. And so the one that Steve Sislak gave to Kathleen included his marriage proposal. Now mine didn't include anything great like that. It said, man who makes love on hill, him not on level. And so I wanna thank you, Nix, for your attention, Nix. And to those who contributed to the slides for this presentation, Nix. And thank you for your attention. And if you wanna learn more about the Chinese in Nevada, here are three of the books that uh, you might turn to. Thank you again. And now for the questions. Okay, Dr. Chung, uh, we have a couple of questions so far. Uh, one is, uh, do we know the name of the Chinese cook who worked at OD Gas's ranch? I love the fact that the first quote unquote restaurant in Vegas was run by a Chinese cook. Unfortunately, the Chinese never made it into the newspapers or seldom made it into the newspapers. And so we have very little documentation about who they were, what they did, but we do know that they did cook at various hotels and clubs and ranches and other um, facilities. And there were a lot of them who were still servants to Euro American families, so much so that the families love them so much that they are buried with the families since they had no family in the United States. Okay, we have another which um, we can help answer uh, as well. Uh, so no Chinese signs at the Neon Museum. No, no, other than the, the China doll, uh, that's so cute. All right, we have another one. Uh, are there any landmarks in Las Vegas celebrating Asian Americans? Not that I know of, other than the Chinatown Mall, not really. Oh, there, there are two parks. There's the Richardtown Park and the Joe Shung Park. And so I guess you could call them um, signs of acknowledging the Chinese presence here. Okay, next question is, any places recommended to visit? I guess it's pretty general, but probably Las Vegas, uh, I'm thinking. Well, I think it's fun to go down Spring Mountain Road because Chinatown has grown both to the uh, west and to the east. And so there are lots of interesting little shops and lots of restaurants along Spring Mountain Road. Okay, and we're hoping up. to have a Chinese American museum. Greg Lee is, is working to raise money for it. And he wants to put it somewhere near the, free, free, near the freeway, somewhere around Sahara and uh, Station Casino. Okay, you beat me to that follow up um, about the museum. Um, Another one is, what are some Chinese American groups that you recommend getting involved in in the Las Vegas community? There, there are a number of them. There's the U.S. China Friendship Association, which sponsors 
bringing a lot of Chinese, um, and including Chinese uh, children and students, um, when the United States recognized China under Nixon, um, there are cultural activities, there are um, various groups that meet. There's a, a Chinese musical organization, so you can hear traditional Chinese music. And of course, there's the Chinatown Mall that you can see all kinds of Chinese things displayed. Okay, thank you. And kind of related to a couple of things you just mentioned, uh, when did Chinatown in Las Vegas start? It actually started very early in the 1950s. Wing Fong tried to get the Chinatown to start at near the um, Fong's Gardens, but that little Chinatown, which had a couple of grocery stores and a few stores, really didn't make it. And it wasn't until the 1995 Chinatown Mall opening that you see the flourishing of what we could call a commercial Chinatown rather than a domestic or residential Chinatown. And one of the reasons for this is Las Vegas is open. And so the Chinese from 1905 on could live almost anywhere in Las Vegas, unlike cities like San Francisco. But there were very few restricted areas where Chinese could not live. And so you have a spread out Chinese American community and not one that is really uh, anchored by a residential area. All right, well, you almost answered the question uh, in, what, in your reply just now, but uh, the next one, what was the appeal for Chinese people to move to Las Vegas versus Los Angeles or San Francisco in the very early days? The appeal was you, you could become successful fairly easily in Las Vegas, and you didn't have such competition. You didn't face the huge discrimination that you faced, let's say, in San Francisco. Um, and the weather wasn't so difficult that, you know, you didn't want to live there. Now, if, if you had a choice between living in Boston or Las Vegas, I'm sure a lot of them would select Las Vegas over Boston because of the weather. Okay, uh, next one is um, a comment rather than a question, but it's um, from Karen, who says, my father, Ki Cho Ju Chen and his friend, Mr. Hong, were the first two Kino writers brought to Las Vegas in 1953 to work at the old California club. They were brought in from California for their speed and using the calligraphy pens. Yes. And in the, when originally the uh, Kino game was played in non-Chinese facilities, they had to have brush writers uh, block out the numbers with Chinese brush and ink. And uh, they stopped that, oh, I think about 1980 in the major casinos. Okay, the next one. Uh, I remember a few Chinese fusion restaurants such as Luigi and Wong's back in the late 70s. Any others still active in the area? There are a number of them that are still active, um, but some have closed as well because of the pandemic. But um, offhand, I think, you know, like Chang's on um, near Tropicana is a long standing Chinese restaurant which has that Chinese architectural front that you saw in the slide program. And um, let's see, well, Gung Fu in the Chinatown Plaza, but further to the east uh, has been here since at least the early 1970s. And they serve now a mix of uh, Thai and Chinese food. Okay, next question. Um, do you have a map of Chinese history happened here or something like that? A map? Yes, a map. They want to know if there is a map that shows uh, Chinese history. No. In Las Vegas or in the West or from California to Nevada? Not clear, but I think they meant Las Vegas. Oh, no, no Chinese map. 
Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, the Elvis Presley movie Viva Las Vegas has a montage of shows, including one featuring Asian performers, I believe at the Thunderbird. So it seems like this was an actual show. Is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. The Thunderbird had a number of, of Asian shows. So um, that's not surprising. And, and my favorite was the China Dow Review because it lasted for a number of years. You know, some of them were very short, short-lived, but some of them, you know, had a going steady uh, customer. All right, next question uh, is uh, the $50 passage from China to the US. Did they arrive in New York City or Los Angeles? Did no. Chinese in the early 1900s move to Nevada from back East at all? No, they usually didn't. Oh no, I, I say that. And the Fong brothers actually were in Texas and then came to Las Vegas. But most Chinese in the very early days landed, well, until the 1870s, landed in San Francisco. And then eventually they will land in Seattle, Portland, and Los Angeles and San Diego. And then they will migrate eastward as their job or some opportunity opened up for them. And in the building of the railroads, they generally uh, will build the railroad. And if they got stuck in some town or another, uh, then they tended to stay there. So, um, or, or they tried to move around in that area. And so we see the Chinese scattering all over the United States by the building of the railroads or mining or agricultural work. They were hired to do agricultural work as well. They also did shoemaking, cigar making. In fact, they were one of the major cigar makers in the West in the late 19th century. So a lot of different jobs opened to them. Next question uh, from Linda is, my mother and stepfather owned and operated the Club Cafe on 2nd and Carson starting in 1949. Do you know its history? Oh, no, I don't know its history. And, and maybe they have something to donate either to our um, restaurant menu collection at UNLV or you know anything that they could donate to Su Kim Chang would be wonderful so that we could have documentation of these early places, which no one talks about or has any indication that existed. Okay, thanks for that question. Uh, the next one is, uh, there were silver mining in the road between California and Las Vegas. Do you think there really were really Chinese who worked there in the past? Not Sorry, it's not 100% about Las Vegas Chinese history. Um, the Chinese did some silver mining, but along the road from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, they were also into borax mining. And so if you're an old timer or you use 20 mil team borax, uh, this is primarily a mineral that the Chinese were very active in harvesting. Right, next question. Uh, can you explain the Kino game? How was it played with the Chinese characters? Well, if you didn't read Chinese, you just picked a character that you thought was interesting. Now, a, a second grader in China could repeat that poem to you word for word, no mistake. So it's something like, you know, that we would know Jack and Jill went up the hill, you know, that kind of thing. And so the Chinese knew which ones to pick, but a non-Chinese person would just randomly pick characters. And then if those characters won and they could see it because they posted the characters that won, then you won your, your Kino game. Uh, and then I don't know when the transition came from characters to numbers, but when the numbers came out one to 80, it was easier for you to realize that you won the game or won some money from the game because it's a graded, uh, winning, you know, if you get hit three spots, you get so much, four spots, so much, six spots, you know, then you get a jackpot, I think. For one who doesn't play Kino, this, this is all I know. <laughs> 
Derek, do you have okay. any other questions? Uh, we have a few more. Uh, okay. We have time for, I think, uh, to get to all of them. If, uh, let's see. Next one, uh, you may have said it already, but was there an area of town that the city made the Chinese live, like a real Chinatown, like in San Francisco? No, they were scattered throughout Las Vegas. And that was interesting because they had to, you know, there was this stereotype the Chinese all stayed together. But in Las Vegas, you couldn't do that because you didn't necessarily live next door to someone who was Chinese. I don't have any Chinese neighbors. Okay, uh, next one. My parents' honeymoon was in Las Vegas in 1954. Was their marketing toward Chinese American tourists or was Las Vegas simply a renowned destination already at that time? They came from San Francisco. Yeah, it was a renowned destination, but it was also a Chinese American destination because they wanted to see what was going on and they wanted to see these shows at the casinos that featured Chinese Americans just like uh, the Forbidden City in San Francisco featured these acts that were, you know, the first time you might say that Chinese entertainers and performers could be seen in a show and doing a variety of different things and showing off their talent. Like I still remember watching the flamenco dancers at the Forbidden City because I have been studying Spanish dancing. Okay, uh, next one. What are the oldest still existing Chinese owned businesses and restaurants? <gasps> oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't go back and date the, the places, so I don't really know which one is the oldest. I would say Fong, Fong's Garden is one of the oldest. Um, but for years, uh, there was this um, restaurant in a store on Fremont Street that um, the, uh, the family from Boulder City, uh, the Lees, owned, and they were famous for their tomato beef chow mein, for example. And, and they owned that since, well, beginning in the 1950s at least. Okay, this next one is related to uh, what you mentioned about the restaurant menu collection at UNLV. Um, is that available to the public? Yes, you can look at them. Everything at UNLV is open to the public. You might not be able to take it out and take it home, but you can look at it in the library. Yes, yeah, so we have another question about that. Um, what places can I go to at UNLV to see materials related with, uh, with this history? And so I think that would be like special collections and archives. Special collections, right. Sue Kim Chung, you know, her name is so close to mine that if you remember mine, you could probably go up there and say, you know, the, the lady who, whose last name is Chung, and, and she will guide you to whatever you need. She's excellent. She's a PhD in library science. Yes, and to add to that, uh, some of the materials you can find online if you go to UNLV Digital Collections. Um, right. Not everything, but a lot is there as well. Okay, uh, we'll get to a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, do you know the portion of Paper Sons that came to Las Vegas? Not as many, because Paper Sons were only popular after the 1882-1892 Exclusion Act. And so what happens is that these people could not immigrate unless they were related to a merchant. And so a merchant or a person who went back to China but who had status here in the United States would go home, declare the birth of child that didn't exist, and then sell that space to somebody who wanted to come to the United States as that person's son or daughter. And so what happens is uh, this movement begins to be popular from, oh, I would say 1890 until 1920. And, and then it, it drops off. But in 1950, the government decided that they were gonna put a stop to all of this and had a confession program in which you could confess that you were a paper son, daughter, or wife, 
And if you did, uh, you would then be legitimized afterwards. But some of them were deported because it was too shady and too crooked. And so you never knew if you confessed whether you would be deported or you would be able to stay. It was really a gamble. And a lot of people didn't confess. But the Chinese always know their real last name. But sometimes last names are so problematic. Like I had grew up with a friend named Jower, and I said, How did you ever get the last name Jower? He said, Well, our last name is Chow. And my father was second son. So when the first son went through immigration, he was Jow E. And when my father went through, he was Jow Er. And so J O W E R is their last name. And they're not a paper son. So you never know what, what's what. Well, a couple people have the same question uh, related to education. One, was there a Chinese school in Las Vegas? And then somebody else asked, uh, were there any Chinese language schools or education programs in Las Vegas? Okay, when Lily Fong became the first Chinese American school teacher, she opened the Saturday Chinese language school in which the Lee brothers, one is a lawyer, one is an accountant, and one is a doctor, I had to go to Chinese language school with Lily Fong. Lily did all kinds of programs, cultural and ritual programs for students uh, and encouraged learning about China and Chinese things because she was one of 10 children in Arizona. whose father sent her to China for 10 years and she came back in the 1920s with the knowledge of Chinese, Chinese culture. She could do calligraphy, she could paint, she could speak. And so she passed this on to a lot of the young Chinese children in the 1950s and 60s in Las Vegas. Okay, next question. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, were the Chinese allowed to stay in the Las Vegas hotels? I recall Chinese American friends who were denied a room at a motel in California when they were traveling on the road. You know, I don't know. I know they were allowed to stay in motels, but I don't know if they were allowed to stay in the major casinos. Of course, Africa, we know that African Americans were not. Uh, and even if you were performing in the major casino like Sammy Davis Jr., you couldn't stay in the, uh, the major casinos and hotels. So I would assume it was a color barrier for all peoples of color. Now, poor peoples of color is another story. All right, well, uh, here's a question. Um, it's actually, I guess it could relate to what were your goals for this program. Um, it says, as a scholar and resident, what are your personal goals for the first year and beyond? Well, it's not, you're not going to be here a whole year, but what uh, what were some of your goals, I guess, with, with this program? And we do have um, a little more that you're working on with us, right? Well, you know, I think that it's really important, and I think the Neon Museum has given me the opportunity for more people to appreciate what the Chinese have done, what they've accomplished, and what they've contributed to the development, not only of Las Vegas, but also throughout other parts of the United States. And so my goal is to spread this information and spread this knowledge so that, you know, it, it, it's, it, there's an old uh, sociological theory that when you meet somebody who looks different, who might speak different, act different, or, or believe different things, that you immediately are afraid of them. And that's called xenophobia, fear of foreigners. And what this kind of program can do is to quell that, that fear of foreigners and make you understand what these people who look different, who speak different, maybe, who eat different foods, maybe, uh, who believe different things, maybe, uh, should not be people who are feared, but that they are, should be appreciated for what their culture has to offer. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have a few more before we wrap up. Uh, one uh, is related to something you just talked about uh, in answering another question, 
but Kimberly wants to know what language was Lily Fong teaching? Mandarin? Oh, Cantonese? She taught Cantonese, yes. And she wanted to have Cantonese taught at the university, but could never get that through. But she did sponsor having Mandarin uh, taught at the university. And so she funded the first few years of the teaching of Mandarin at UNLV, which was a big boon and had a good enrollment. And, you know, it, it's amazing. I, my uh, youngest son went to China with me and for six months, he studied Chinese and came out fluently as well as being able to read and write. So I was, you can really do this. It's not such a strange language. I had another doctoral candidate from UNR who went to Taiwan and in three months on an intensive language program could read and speak Chinese and translate Chinese medicinal terms, which was the subject of her dissertation. Okay, a couple more. Um, one is, how did Pai Gao come to Vegas? And were there any Chinese gangsters in Vegas in the past? Okay, Pai Gao is one of the traditional games that started in Northern Nevada. And the Northern Nevada casinos or gaming halls began to have non-Chinese customers as early as the probably the 1860s and 70s. And Pai Gao was one of the games. Kino was another game that they could participate in. And then there's another dice game called High Low. And so what happened was the uh, casinos such as Caesar's Palace decided that these games would attract not only Asian gamblers, but also non-Asian gamblers and included them in their offering of uh, what the casino had to offer. As far as gangsters, Chinese American gangsters, there probably was not because there was such small Chinese population in Las Vegas. Okay, uh, looks like we have one more, okay. uh, which is what motivated you to study Chinese history? <laughs> it was the furthest thing from my parents' mind. And in fact, when I went to college, I, my first year I was uh, majoring in bacteriology, but I took a history class and I fell in love with history. And so I went from Chinese history and American history into a greater development of Chinese history, which required learning Chinese, Japanese, and a European language. And for, for me, that was German. So top that with my Latin, um, I could translate and read all these different documents in those language, languages. And I love teaching about China because most Americans know so little about China and have these stereotypes that are so wrong that must be eliminated. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Chung. I think that is all the questions we have. Okay, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek, for assisting. Um, before I close, there's this one nugget that I want to share with everyone, because during the presentation, of course, she's going through her slides. There was questions about this, and I wanted to share this because most of you will be able to relate to it since you are participating and you're interested. In that menu, one of the items was coffee. And in that menu, it said, if your coffee is weak, gloom descends upon your whole family. That's how they roll back in those days. Or you better make your coffee strong. Again, as I said previously, I told you folks you were in for a treat, and I think everybody learned so much. Dr. Chung, we deeply appreciate you. We know that your time is valuable. All my participants, we thank you for your participation. We thank you for your continued support. And if you are interested and you want to volunteer or learn more about the museum or memberships, please visit us at neonmuseum.org. Again, I want to thank our sponsors, the Nevada Arts Council, 
our board of trustees, and remember the Nevada Arts Council gets their support from National Endowment of the Arts. Never to forget, thank you to my team, Derek and Steve in the background, and of course, our scholar, Dr. Chung, no relation, bless you and thank you for joining us and sharing all of your knowledge about Chinese and Las Vegas history. With that, thank we you. bid you farewell. Thank you for your participation and good night from the Neon Museum. <laughs>